man, he's incredible. He's, there's, there's no God like our God. You, you ought to have something jumping on the inside of you. Amen. But I'll preach. Amen. It's great to see you on this wonderful day. I do need to thank everyone who stood outside in the cold and rang the bell for hours. So if you were part of that, just go ahead and stand just real quick. This will be the last time I ask you to stand until next year. Amen. 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 Praise God. And, uh, as always, we are so grateful for Karar and uh, all who minister. I was talking with Sister Price Thomas on yesterday, and I shared a video with her of a church that had a dance a group, and uh, one of the members of the group was 93 years old. Amen. So uh, you ought to get your dance shoes out. Amen. Let's stand to our feet for the reading of the word. And this morning, we are still celebrating. Christ. Amen. It's great to see each of you on today. Amen. Amen. Do me a favor and find someone to say, it's great to see you. Come on, look up in the eye. It's great to see you. Hey, Pastor, it's great to see you today. Amen. It's always great to see Pastor Uriah. Forgive me for calling you by your first name. But it's always great to see you. And I, I enjoy reading your latest writing. Amen. Great to see each of you. We're coming from Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. It's also in your bulletin. It's also in your bulletin, but it is Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Amen. It's great to see Brother Paul Garrett. Brother Paul Garrett, I've been meaning to thank him. He redid our sign out in front. His son actually did it for his Eagle Scout badge, so he had it painted and a new lock put on. So we thank you for that. Amen. Brother Paul Garrett, great to see you. Amen. See, y'all think I don't know when y'all travel. I do. Amen. Uh, Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, begin at verse 39. Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 39. And it reads like this. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened. When Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, that the babe jumped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed well, there will be fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. Amen. And praise God. Do me a favor and just find three people and touch them and say something to shout about. Come on. Got Oh God, we thank you now. We praise you for your presence in this place, God. God, help us to have the focus to worship you, God. We thank you for this season, which is an outward reminder of an inward worship. We thank you for this Advent season that celebrates the event of the celebrant. We thank you, God. Solo Dio Gloria. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. I stand before you confessing that although it is my job to preach, and I, I really do love to preach, I've been doing it for about 22 years, I recognize a real challenge. That it becomes easy for us to talk about God and somehow not talk about Jesus. 
that we live in a world where even Christmas has become so polluted that we miss the mark when it comes to celebrating Christ. And if it's not the pollution in the world, then it has to be pollution in our heart. That could be that we've lost a loved one or we're disappointed with circumstances or there's some situation. But I've come by to tell you that if there's anything I could ever say to you that should ever make you want to get up out your seat, wave your hands, and worship God, if there is anything I could say to you that should excite you and emote something on the inside, can I tell you it's that Jesus was born. The truth is, when you understand the birth of Jesus Christ, I just come by to tell you, you've got something to shout about. When you understand what it means that a baby was born for you, that the Savior of the world, that the King of kings, that the Lord of lords, that my Messiah, your Savior, came here in Bethlehem, hallelujah and praise God. In fact, uh, can, I, can I give you a phrase? I'll call it Jesus joy. Would you say that? Jesus joy. You ought to have some Jesus joy when you think about Jesus being born. You, you ought to have something rising up on the inside. Jeremiah said it's like fire shut up in my bones. I can't keep it in. You ought to have something that makes you move and makes you want to get up out your seat. It's called Jesus joy. The truth is, when you understand Jesus joy, you'll have something to shout about. Let me see if I can make it plain because our text is tailored to teach us that when you have Jesus joy, you will have something to shout about. It's Luke that writes in a very unique way. Luke starts off by telling the story of Zacharias and Elizabeth. And remember, we looked at them last week. You got to get the tape. We looked at them last week, Zachariah and Elizabeth. They were senior citizens, and the Lord saw fit to give them a baby. Uh, they were seniors. They were members of AARP. And God said, I want you to experience pregnancy. And so uh, here they were, pregnant. And now the next scene that Luke's moved to is an awesome scene because it is the scene of Mary at home and she gets the word from the angel, I'll call him the good news angel, the angel Gabriel that she will have a baby. Now you know that is exciting but here it's also problematic. I should tell you it's exciting but it's also problematic because Mary was engaged but she was not married. Now, let me make it plain. See in that day they did it God's way and God said that you don't have babies until you're married. And so it was problematic. Even worse, her fiancé had nothing to do with her pregnancy. So she had to go to her fiancé and explain, look, Joseph, his name was, he was a good and godly man. He loved the scriptures, and he loved the Lord, and he loved Mary. So, he, so Mary went to him. Mary said, uh, Joseph, I am having a baby. Okay, now we all know the story, so it sort of misses the point. But, but let me explain, in that time, for Joseph's ears, that was not something that you could pass over. Because Joseph was not interested in anything immaculate. Joseph was not believing that there was any situation that would allow for her to be pregnant except for him. Yeah, yeah, see, Joseph was holy, so Joseph was waiting. So the first thought that had to come to Joseph's mind was, wait a minute, I have been waiting for you, and I thought you were waiting for me. Okay, y'all have to put this in your own life circumstance. If you go home and, 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 and you, 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 well, never mind. Well, it's the idea that somebody you love who is faithful to you winds up pregnant and it is not yours. That is a big problem. In fact, Deuteronomy says that Joseph was to take Mary to her father, put her at the front of the house, and stone her because of the act. That's what the law said. And yet, Joseph kept his cool. And Joseph was calm. And the next scene that we find them out, because God gave him confirmation, is now Elizabeth runs to the house to see Mary. It says she moved with haste. You, you see, two 
pregnant sisters knew they needed to get together to experience the confirmation that God had for them. And if I had time, I could even relate that to coming to church, that you ought to get around people who are expecting great things, that you ought to be around people who know that there is a blessing in store for you. You ought to be around people who can say it's only a matter of time before God does something great. You, you ought to put yourself around somebody who's headed in the similar direction, somebody who can look up and bless the Lord, oh my soul. You ought to be in a place with people who are expecting great things. And, and I want you to see uh, how uh, we can experience this Jesus joy. Because look, the text teaches us first. Here's the first thing. Are you ready? The first thing the text teaches us to experience this Jesus joy, you've got to be in the presence of Jesus. Would you say that? You've got to be in the presence of Jesus. Don't say it to your neighbor. Say it to yourself. You've got to be in the presence of Jesus. No, you didn't say it. I saw you. You've got to be in the presence of Jesus. Now, let me make this plain because the key to being in the presence of Jesus, the key to being in relationship with Jesus is a fancy word. You know it. We say it all the time, but let me say it again. It's called salvation. It is the idea that you come into relationship with Jesus Christ and God through Jesus Christ. It's salvation. Now, I know that doesn't sound like much. In fact, if we're not careful, it becomes tertiary. It becomes commonplace. Oh, I've got salvation. But you always must remind yourself. You all must always must shake yourself and remind yourself that before Jesus, you were a mess. Oh yeah, I'm talking to you. You were a mess. You were a hot mess. You were jacked up. You had no hope. You may have looked good. Your wig may have been nice. Your weed may have been working. But you were a mess. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, uh, somebody said, I came to Jesus just as I was, weary, wounded, and worn. I found in him a resting place. Now he, oh y'all missed that, had made me glad. Uh, his name was Horatio. Horatio was a great priest, and Horatio, this being this great priest, you know, I had to look up the, the preacher, great preacher, I had to look up him, so I did some research on him. And, and one of the things he requested when he died, the, the one who wrote that song, he said, I don't want a biography written on me. And so I had to do a lot of research to find any Thing about him and the song, the one who's made it glad. And the research I found simply told me that he had five children. Oh, yes, he did. He had five children, and they consecutively died. Each time he had a child, they died. They died. They died. They died, and they died until the sixth baby. Here he was preaching the gospel. Here he was worshiping and writing worship songs, and all his babies kept dying, and then his wife died. But then when he had his sixth child, the sixth child lived. Years went on, and the sixth child had five children. Yeah, woo, woo, they were productive back then. But the sixth child had five children, and then she became a widow. Her husband died. So the sixth child with five children moved into his house, and he began to thank the Lord. He said, Lord, you took my five children, and now you give me five to raise. Can't I explain to you there's something about joy when you can always find a way to be glad? Because the truth is that the joy that we have, the world didn't give it to us, and the world can't take it away. I, I know you heard it, but let me say it again. The truth is the joy that we have, the world didn't give it to us, and the world didn't take away. Because all our joy is existential joy. It's joy that's anchored in the reality of Jesus Christ. It's not in what we own. It's not in what we drive. It's not in what we wear. It's not in where we've been. It's not in what we understand. It's really in Jesus Christ. And as long as Jesus Christ is settled in the heavens and he's settled in our heart, then we have the access. Okay, let me move on. Okay, growing up, my mother, she really wanted me to be a good Christian. And, and it was really hard. And she asked, if you ask her, she won't tell the truth, but I was a really bad child. And so she would often do things to help me be more Christ-like. So she made me listen to a radio show called Unshackled, exclamation mark. I don't know if you've ever heard the story of Unshackled. The, the story of Unshackled, exclamation mark, is just the story. In fact, it's 4,000 different testimonies of people coming to Christ. Some people had money, some people had none. Some people were on drugs, some people were athletes. Some people seemed to be perfect, but they had problems. But I mean, the truth is, it's just the story of people coming to Christ. And the celebration at the end of every testimony is, I got the key, I got Jesus Christ. And it goes on to talk about not how they became famous or how they became wealthy, but how they found joy. Because Jesus is the key to, I thought this 
would happen. Let me see if I can make it plain. Okay, it was Thanksgiving, and we had at least 30-some people in the house. I mean, the place was bustling. It was all my wife's family. Notice I said my wife's family. I mean, they were having a ball. They were all loud. They were all eating. They were everywhere in every room. And so here they are. I'm sitting at the table. Uh, I came out my room every now and then just to socialize so I wouldn't get in trouble. But so I'm sitting at the table with all these people, and a scene went down just like this. Uh, my cousin sent her brother to the car to get something out of it. And now here I am watching, okay, I'm eating my food. And she says, uh, before you go to the car, put my coat on and then go in my car and get what we need, okay? So he goes to the car, he comes back, and, and he says, uh, your car is locked. And she said, I told you, I told you, I told you. Put my coat on, and then you'll be able to get in the car. So, you know, I'm just watching, you know, watching the scene. After a little while, he comes back in, and he takes the coat off. He gives the coat back to her, and, and she explains. She says, you see, the way my car works is there is a key. But as long as the key is nearby, it unlocks the car. It unlocks everything. You see, the key was in her pocket in her coat. And the way the key worked is if it got into proximity, then it would open up a locked car. Well, can I tell you, Jesus is something like that. That if you get Jesus, what Jesus will do, he will unlock stuff that has been locked up. Oh, oh yes, I appreciate the gifts we're going to get, but the truth is, peace, hope, and joy, he unlocks. Peace, hope, and joy can be unlocked to you. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're dealing with, but I come by to tell you on assignment that he's still unlocking peace, hope, and joy. Hallelujah. Praise God. The first thing this text is tailored to teach us is that when you come into the presence, when you come into the presence, when you come into the presence of Jesus, great things happen. Uh, so first it's the presence, but then it's not just the presence because we have to understand we're looking now at John in utero. We're looking at John in his mama's belly. We're looking at John while he's still inside. And John it celebrates, he gets excited. In fact, he starts jumping up and down when he comes into the presence of Jesus. And I wonder because a lot of us have accepted Jesus, but we don't jump up and down at all. Well, you see, the problem is, the reality is, not only is it the presence of Jesus, but it's the purity of our heart. Oh my God, help me to make this plain. The truth is, uh, if our hearts are not pure, then we cannot fully appreciate the presence of Jesus. See, John was in a pure place with a pure heart. And I can tell you, spiritually speaking, that he was jumping because his heart was pure. The challenge is, okay, okay, let me see if I can, Lord, help me to make it plain. You, you know I like Whitney Houston. You, you, you know I like Whitney Houston. You know, I like Whitney Houston, uh, and hopefully she was one of the most gifted women who ever sang. I was reading on her, and a man named Gordon Kanyon, who became her voice coach in the late 90s, started to tell the story of Whitney Houston. He said that Whitney Houston had an amazing voice, but by the time he started coaching her in the late 90s, she could not have a conversation without her voice cracking. Her voice had been so messed up by the stuff that had happened to her that she could no longer do what she was made to do. Her, her, her vocal cords had been so damaged that she used to come to church and experience the presence of God. But now she can't experience it. She doesn't feel anything. She tried this church. She tried that church. Here a church. There a church. Everywhere a church. Church. But still, there's something wrong. She used to be able to drive in the car and listen to gospel, I'm not talking about Whitney anymore. Uh, uh, and, and when she listened to the gospel, her eyes used to well up with tears, but something has happened. You see, the problem is when we allow stuff into our life that God, okay, all right, all right, I, I know I'm in the Bible because the Bible says in Matthew chapter five, verse eight, it, it says, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Okay, you're missing that, y'all not getting that. I, I need to get this, blessed, are the peer in heart, for they shall see God. Uh, okay, uh, the Bible tells us in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord, the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell in. For he has bounded upon the seas and established upon the floods. Who can ascend into the hill of the Lord? But he that hath clean hands and a 
pure heart. Can I tell you that if you want to experience the presence of God and the moving of God and the joy of God, then there's some stuff you got to get out. That there's some stuff. You, it could be bitterness. It, it could be pornography. It, it could be womanizing. It could be manizing. I don't know. It, whatever it is, if you get it out your life, then you'll have a, a, a feeling of God's presence in your life. And the problem is, a lot of us haven't experienced the full presence of God because we're holding on to the junk of earth. Okay, okay, okay. All right. All right, I, I see the problem. I see the problem. I, I know that Whitney was that Whitney story. That was a hard story. To, let, let me give you another one. Uh, right now in Beijing, uh, Beijing, B E I J I N G. Yeah, Beijing. I looked it up. That's how you spell it. In Beijing, the largest city in the world. And in fact, there are one million and seven hundred thousand plus people who live there. If you look at a picture of Beijing right now, they're all wearing masks. They wear masks because their air is polluted. There's so much toxins in the air that the government has literally banned people from driving on certain days. They wear masks because people can get so sick that they will die from their own air. They're spending all this money trying to fix the problem, but you know, the only way, the only way that this red alert in Beijing will go down is if a fresh wind comes through. The only way that all that pollution can be moved out is when the wind comes through. I don't know if you've noticed Luke, but Luke is high on the Holy Spirit. In fact, in chapter 1, he mentions the Holy Spirit eight times because he understands that when you get Jesus, you get the Holy Spirit. When Jesus is in your heart and your life and you yield to him, he will put the deposit of the Holy Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit assignment is to do, in, in large part, is to purify stuff that has been polluted. Okay, I know I'm in the Bible because it was David who said in Psalm 51, David after he had killed a man, David after he had stolen a man's wife, David after he had been a bad mama, David after he was a bad dude, uh, he said, the Lord, I need your Holy Spirit to restore in me and renew in me a right spirit. And then he said, so that I might know joy again. I come by to tell somebody, I don't know who this is for. It might be the person next to you. It might be the person to the right of you, or it might be the person inside of you. But I came by to let you know, if you want to experience the joy of God, allow his Holy Spirit to move in your life. In the Bible, I, I, I told you, I told you in Matthew chapter 5, verse Eight, I, I told you that, that, that those who hunger, uh, uh, that, that, that those who uh, have a pure heart will see God. That's part of the B attitudes, the happy wake up, the happy attitudes, the joyous attitudes. Well, it's in that same chapter, the B attitudes, the happy attitudes, the blessed attitudes, it says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. I'm not going to give you a list of 50 things to do. I want to start with the heart. That if you decide in your heart, God, I want to be holy. God, I want to be right. God, I want to be pure. God, take these thoughts out of my mind. God, help me to drive down the road without looking at every jogger. God, help me not to say something negative all the time. God, help me not to gossip. God, help me not to be so mean. If you have that heart, you know what God will do? God will start working with you, working on you, and working in you. And before you know it, uh, all that stuff that used to be up in you, you'll say, I haven't cussed all week. I haven't cussed all month. I still got hit a C from two months ago sitting in my cast. I haven't, I haven't slapped nobody in a long time. I haven't caught a case in a long time. I'm doing all right. You'll discover that when your heart chases after God, the Holy Spirit will minister to your heart and work in your heart, and you'll experience the joy of God. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. I, I, I see. I see. I got to make it plain. Uh, you see, first, it's the presence. That's salvation. It's the presence. It's the presence of Jesus in your life. But look, if we're not careful, we allow pollution in our life, so we need to go back to God so he will have his Holy Spirit clean out our life. The presence of Jesus in our life, the purity of our heart that allows us to relate to Jesus. But can I tell you, and it took me a long time to really get this. I was talking to the Lord to so help me understand how John was able to start jumping up and down uh, simply by being in your what, what, what do we need to do so that we can do what John did? What is the trick? What is the secret? 
And after praying and studying and looking at the word, can I tell you that after you get in the presence of Jesus, after you allow your heart to be a pure place, then the only thing you have to do is allow God to do what you were meant to do. Oh, oh, okay, okay. I, I read the story. I'll make it plain. I read the story of a particular denomination. I won't say which denomination it is. I'm not trying to start a fight. But, but, the, but the pastor noted, uh, I should say the priest noted, that, that, that nobody said amen. Nobody waved their hand. Nobody stood up. Nobody exclaimed that God was good. They just looked like, don't look around, don't look around. Uh, they just looked sad. And so one day, he gave every single person in the congregation a balloon filled with helium. And he said, hold on to the balloon, the whole service, until you feel the moving of the spirit. One after another, a song was sung, balloon went up. A prayer was prayed, balloon went up. Some folk walked in as soon as they stepped in. And they felt the spirit, the balloon went up. One after another, towards the end of the service, there were still a few people dispersed throughout the sanctuary. They didn't let their balloons go. They didn't let it loose. And so the preacher had to say, now look, y'all, y'all have to let it loose. Because the truth is, when you get Jesus in your heart, when you begin to think on the goodness of the Lord and all he's done for you, how he's opened doors and closed doors for you, how he made ways for you, after a while, you'll just have to let it loose because it's something on the inside that you got to let go of. It's something that he's done. I cannot explain. All that I know is something within me, something within me I cannot explain. It's almost like almost like a bird that has to chirp or a dog that has to bark or a cat that has to go meow or a cow that has to go moo. And after a while, you see, I gotta worship the Lord. In fact, that's what this text means. In fact, uh, what he was doing was jumping up and down inside the womb. Well, do you know one of the worship words, agaleo, really means to rejoice and that translates to jump up and down. After a while, when you realize that's what you were made to do, you discover, I can't help myself. I, I can't stop it. When I think about God, when I feel his presence moving on the inside, I, when I think about his wonderful kindness toward me, when I think about his loving mercies, I see day after day, I can't help myself. I gotta move up and down. I gotta jump up and down because at the end of the day, 